welcome to the Thrive Today podcast. I'm Natalie Bourne. I'm the media host for Thrive Today and the founder of Innovation Meets Leadership. We are a podcast for women who lead and believe. And today, I'm so excited to sit down with my friend, Ryan Dunlap. He is not only the founder of Conflictish, which we're going to talk a little bit about, but his background is, is going to be very unique and interesting. And I'm actually going to let him share with you his background because it is so phenomenal. Welcome to the podcast, Ryan. Thanks, Natalie. So glad to be here. Let's go. All right, take a moment for us. Walk us through your background. Like, tell us a little bit about your backstory and then tell us what you're doing today and why you found it your company. Yeah, for sure. So background, like you said, it's it's quite broad. And but I I think it's been very like circuitous how we've kind of landed here. Right. So my majority of my experience comes from law enforcement. I spent 14 years in law enforcement. I got to wear a lot of different hats. I jokingly tell people all the time that if you've seen a TV show about it, I've probably done it at some point. So I was a, I did special operations. I was a gang intelligence officer, a special victims detective. I was a SWAT hostage negotiator and a crisis interventionist and so many other different things. So throughout my law enforcement career, really the, the, the thread that was woven through all of my different experiences and assignments was that I was the guy people called to have really difficult conversations. That's essentially what it came down to interrogations, interviews, negotiations. That's what I really kind of cut my teeth on. And then I transitioned out of law enforcement and went into full-time ministry and initially was the director of security at Victory. And then was I stepped into the pastor of life safety role, which kind of had more of a ministerial focus on what we were doing. And that really kind of borrowed from First Thessalonians 5.23, I believe, was the guiding scripture we used. May the God of peace sanctify you through and through body, spirit, and soul. So what we wanted to do is not just have like a physical security component of what we did, but also an emotional and a spiritual security side of things. So that allowed me to step into some other seats, eventually stepped into the executive director of operations role for Victory. And after that, I transitioned to Street Grace, became the executive director of operations, or no, the executive director for Street Grace in Tennessee, expanding the anti-trafficking work from Georgia into Tennessee. And man, outside of that, I've sat on two state boards. I, ser- I served on Georgia's sexual assault response team, state expert committee on Tennessee's human trafficking advisory council. We, we did a lot of legislative work. We passed laws that made sense and in the space of assault and, and victimization for people who are, are victimized. And, you know, spent 20 years. I mean, it's been 20 years of really being in the room, having difficult conversations with folks. And that really is why I do the work that I do now at Conflict-ish, which is a conflict strategy firm dedicated to helping leaders navigate conflict issues and get their ish together. So we kind of playfully say from hellish attitudes, squeamish conversations, diminished productivity. We help leaders navigate all of that ish. And it's it's been fun. It's been cool. We primarily do executive coaching. We do a lot of corporate training and a lot of keynote speaking. We've got clients from South America through Canada, Europe, Australia. We've, we've been all over the place. So it's been pretty fun so far. That's powerful. Well, you have such an awesome background. I felt like it would be a really cool conversation just to spend some time talking about conflict. It's part of what we deal with in our day to day, whether we are, no matter what kind of conversation we have, it usually turns into a negotiation, right? One person wants one thing, the other person wants something else. And oftentimes, whether we know it or not, we end up in a negotiation. So this is your wheelhouse and your background. I thought it would be super fun just to, as we connect with the women of Thrive Today, to spend some time talking a little bit about this world that you live in every day, that many of us, honestly, when we think about being in that world, maybe it's a little harder because we don't live and breathe it like you have. I thought it would be really cool for us to dive in and, and talk a little bit about that. So yeah. let's let's start with conversations. How do you know you're in a high stakes conversation? What does that look like when you're in it? And how should we be thinking about how to approach these? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a great question because high stakes is really a subjective, it's a subjective label, right? What's high stakes for me might not be high stakes for you. And and this is why I think it's always important to start every conversation from a standpoint of understanding the other side's proposition and understanding their position. Because if if I'm in a high stakes conversation that's high stakes for someone else, but it's not high stakes for me, I might not put everything into that conversation. Yeah. I might not be willing to be as flexible or as empathetic as I need to because I haven't measured the impact that this conversation has on the person I'm talking to. So, you know, how you know is whether whether or not you've taken the time to actually ask the question, what's at stake? 
Hmm. What's at stake for me? What's at stake for you? And once we know what the stakes are, we can have an appropriate response for whatever, whatever we're facing. And, you know, just that's, that's, that's a good starting place is to kind of know what's at stake. But then we, we kind of transition very quickly from understanding what's at stake to what's the goal, what's the objective. And, and what I find is a lot of times we get into these high stakes conversations without defining a clear objective. And so we start talking about the problem, how it happened, how it made us feel, everything except for how do we move forward? Mm -hmm. And so once we've understood what's at stake, we have to get really, really clear early on in the conversation about what our future state looks like. And, and when we miss that, we find ourselves just kind of spinning our wheels, stuck in our story, unable to move forward. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes a ton of sense. And I think that I want to camp out here just for a second. So that is, I think, really the crux of the issue, right? Is that we are so focused on telling our story that we're not asking what's at stake, what is the end goal that I want? When I walk out of this conversation, what does success look like to me? And success may mean taking my story down a notch to not focus on that so much and really cross the line to ask the other person, what are they, what's at stake for them mm -hmm. and what do they need? I think the biggest challenge we have in conversations is that we don't approach, we don't approach them intentionally. And so I want to sp spend a little bit more time here. Let's, let's say, let's give, let me give you a scenario because I think this will be helpful for our listeners. Let's say that you've just found out that you are the lowest paid person in the department you have been there a little bit longer than everyone else and you deliver a ton of value. Like, you know how hard you work. You know that you are knocking it out of the park. And now you're going to sit down with your boss. And for you, it's a huge, not only does it feel like disrespect, but it's a high state conversation for you. Your emotions are involved now. And you really want to just kind of stick it to the man and say, hey, we got to talk about my pay. But you know that that approach is not going to work. Like, yeah. walk us through taking ourselves down a notch, right? We're now in a state of fight or flight. We're angry. How do we approach this situation where we can get the outcome we want and remove the emotion from it? Yeah. So really great, right? So when it comes to like these, these really high tension salary negotiation things, I think what happens is we go into the conversation really focused on the outcome we want without fully understanding the constraints on the other side of the table. And so I always start from this place of really understanding the other person's perspective, right? So I wanna challenge my perception by gaining new perspectives. Mm -hmm. And so I'm gonna ask these questions that are more or less tied to my supervisor's decision-making, right? What, what are, what's the budget for this role? And is that, this might not necessarily be the conversation I'm having with them. This could just be investigatory, things that I'm looking for in the background. What constraints are my supervisor under? What other salary limitations are there uh, across the organization? Uh, is the organization in a position to pay more? Which a lot of times they are, they'll say they're not. But when, when I take the time to really understand how this leader is making this decision, I'll speak to their process, not to my outcome, right? Mm -hmm. And so, hey, so my understanding is that this role has a salary range between one hundred and twenty dollars and $150,000. And I recognize that I'm at the lower end of this pay raise, however, or this pay rate. However, I recognize that you said that I'm one of the top performers in, in this particular department in this space. Can you help me understand the thought process or the decision-making process behind compensation for high performers, right? And, and again, what it does is it, it puts you into this process of self-determination hmm. where now the leader has to explain things without defending themselves, right? Yeah. And, and I think that's the problem. A lot of times when we feel offended, when we feel attacked, we will, we will share that emotionally. And, and what we'll do is we'll start saying things like, you aren't paying me what I'm worth. You right. are doing this to me. And really what we want to use is something called a three-part assertive message to communicate mm -hmm. value, right? When you told me that I was one of the best performing, performing team members on the, on the, in the department, but you didn't increase my pay rate proportionately, it caused me to feel like I wasn't as valuable as you said I was. Mm -hmm. And that caused me to pull back a little bit. And I know that's not your intention. So can you help me understand it? Right. So this three-part assertive message is really a framework that says when you, I felt which caused. And, and it's a very uh, safe way of not saying you label, mm -hmm. you yeah. did this to me. You're a bad boss. You're a terrible leader. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, hey, when we had that conversation, you said this, 
it made me feel this way and it caused this response. Help me understand. Yeah. And what we're doing is we're just removing the opportunity for offense as best we can. But we have to understand anytime you challenge someone with a salary conversation, they're probably going to feel defensive. They're okay. probably going to feel a little bit tense. And so we have to be ready for, for that uh, response, if that makes sense to you. I love this because immediately as you started stepping through that, what I thought was, well, how would I want to be approached in that situation? Would I want someone to come in and point their finger in my face and tell me you're not paying me enough? Or would I want someone to sit down and rationally ask me, hey, can you just help me understand a little bit better? Here's Mm -hmm. where I feel I'm at. Is that true? Do you need to give me feedback otherwise? Here's what I'm seeing the ranges are in the market. Maybe I don't say I know what my peers are making. Maybe I say, here's what the ranges are I'm seeing in the market. And then I'd like to, my personal goal is to get here. What can I do to to reach that? How can I do that? What does that look like? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's, you know, I think a lot of times in most conversations, our brains get hijacked and then it's fight or flight survival mode. and, And we're operating just from a, a very tactical level versus being more strategic in our conversation. Because again, you, unless your desire is to burn the bridge down, we've got to find a better way to approach the situation. Yeah. yeah you're talking, you're talking tact, right? Tact. I, I love it's It's one of my favorite words to explore, right? It's this mm-hmm. adroitness is how it's usually defined in communicating. And, and, and I like to use other words like finesse, Mm-hmm. And and you can't do that if you're operating from a limbic response. If you're in your fight, flight, freeze, or fawn state, and your amygdala hijacked, and your hypothalamus is pumping, and, and all of these other things are happening, you, you've deduced your ability to communicate down to a reptilian level, right? <laughs> and, and what we really want to do is we want to give ourselves an opportunity to think strategically. And we yeah. can only do that if the prefrontal cortex is available to us, where we can think long-term we can think immediate and eventuality, right? Mm-hmm. And one of the things that you know we study in this space is what's called an affect heuristic. And it's that short-term decision-making without consideration for a long-term end state. And that's what emotions do. Emotions sell. Right now, I want to scream. Right now, I want to put that person in their place. Right now, yeah. I want to say the things that I want to say. And we'll do that because it feels good. It's a release. But we have to think about the long-term implications. What does this do about the trust I've established with this person? What does this do for my reputational capital? And and maybe yelling and screaming is going to set me back further than I already am down the road, right? So we don't want to operate out of that brain. And when we recognize we're in that state, we need to pause. I usually tell people to stop space, time, and an opportunity to rethink your approach and then reapproach it when you're in that prefrontal state and you can be strategic and you can say, well, wonder what pressure they're under. I wonder Mm -hmm. how they see this situation. I wonder what their options are or are their hands tied? Are we partners in this problem, right? We can start thinking of other ways to frame the problem so that we can approach it together and not adversarially. Yeah, it's so powerful. I want to tell you a quick story and just maybe we can dissect this for a second. Again, I I just always want to help give Thrive Today tools that they can take back and start to implement right away. I had a situation a couple of years ago where senior vice president, this was several years ago, bashed our department to his entire department. So you're talking about 5,200 people. I found out through the grapevine and I reached out to my boss and I said, hey, this, this is your peer. Would you reach out to him, find out what happened and how we can help? Instead, she sent him directly to me. So on Friday at 530, I got a voicemail that he was going to be in my office on Monday morning to find out what was up and what I had a problem with him about. Wow. Awesome. I had the whole weekend to think about that. (laughs) And so honestly, over the weekend, I took some time. I prayed. I obviously sweated out the fact that this person is going to show up to my office angry on Monday and we're going to have a conversation. At that time, he was several levels above me. So wasn't looking forward to it. And as I prayed, I felt like God said, Don't come in with a defense. Don't even come in and talk about what he said. Ask him what he's missing from your department. So when he walked in at nine o'clock on Monday, I said, hey, he said, hey, I heard this, that, and the other. I said, yeah, you know what? I don't want to talk about that. What I want to ask you is let's look at the year ahead. What are three or four things that we can do to better support your department? What are some things where we can be better business partners together? And for instead of it being a 10 minute conversation where we yelled, It was an hour conversation where we sat down and whiteboarded out the future. And I really remember that conversation deeply as a turning point for 
how I would personally lead because in the past I would have been like, well, yeah, I heard this and I heard that. And it, it just became very tactical, not very strategic in terms of how we were engaging together. Yeah. Super, super powerful. Right. And what, what you did was you made yourself available to listen to the noise, to hear the news. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is something that a lot of people don't do because our listening process starts backwards. So I use this model. It's a listening progression model. And it usually starts from making yourself available to hear, obtaining some level of clarity, demonstrating understanding. And then the fourth level is supposed to be acceptance, right? We accept someone else's understanding or, or position on a particular topic. But usually what happens is we replace acceptance with agreement. Hmm. And we feel that at the highest level, we have to agree with what someone has said. And then we flip the model upside down and we start with agreement. So what happens is if I don't agree with your position, then I won't seek clarity. I won't demonstrate understanding. I won't even make myself available to hear. And so the, the process of listening to someone and asking those questions, those well-timed disruptive questions, Hey, I'm not going to meet you on a battlefield the way you thought I was. Let me ask you a question. How can I be better? How can I help support you? It's like, well, wait a minute. I wasn't expecting that. Mm -hmm. And then you made yourself available to hear. And this is the process of saying, I don't want to be stuck in a story about what went wrong. I want to be future focused about what we can get right moving forward. And that is the, that's the essence of conflict. The problem is most people can't do that because they don't have the wherewithal to pull themselves out of an emotional response. And instead they'll arm themselves with rebuttals and counter arguments and Rogerian arguments and, you know, all of these different things that I'm going to start saying to prove my point. And what we do is we say the things that we want to be heard rather than saying the things that the other person needs to hear. And that's what you did. You said what that person needed to hear. You establish rapport, which opens the door for more. And that conversation wasn't 10 minutes. It was an hour and you built from it. And that's what we should all endeavor to do when we're facing a potentially contentious conversation with someone. Yeah, this is yeah very interesting. Just hearing kind of you dissect that. And I think that this becomes a superpower, right? Being able to jump in, have conversations with people who may feel that contention. I mean, I grew up answering customer service calls, right? So it mm. was like you answer and the person's already screaming, right? Yeah. And so you know that if you interrupt them and you don't actively listen, they're going to start their whole story all over again. And then here we go again for another five, 10 minutes while they retell their story. And so what you're leaning into is that empathy can be a superpower and it can be the way that we open the door to conversations we didn't think we were going to have, even with people who are being deeply hostile or frustrated. And again, us being able to, to listen, not necessarily agree with what they're saying, but to listen actively, to let them know that they're being heard. I mean, this goes a long way. And I think that it's the difference maker of even as you move throughout your career into different levels, whether you own a business or whether you're moving up in corporate the ability to take what's being thrown at you and reverse it into something that can be a meaningful conversation. It's hard to do when your brain's being hijacked. But to me, this is, this is really your FBI training. I mean, it's, it's really being able to have the right conversation at the right time, right? It's your negotiation, your, your training that you've done in just hostage negotiation, right? Yeah. Being able to kind of take, take what's being thrown at you and, and, and throw it back. Yeah. Uh, people always ask, they're like, how do you do the work you did? Like when you sit across the table from someone who's done terrible things, like how do you not want to reach across the table and take them out? You know, and and one of the things we learn in, in the uh, the FBI interviews and interrogation training and the hostage negotiation training, hostage negotiation training that we've done, one of the first things they'll tell you is separate the person from the problem. Hmm. Right. And you want to attack the problem while preserving the person. And what typically happens when people are throwing insults and and doing their whole thing is we're taking it personally and we're assigning blame to an individual rather than really kind of understanding what's the problem that the person has. We see that person as a problem person. Hmm. So that's the first thing we do is we separate the person from the problem. We deal with the problem at hand. The other thing that we really come to re recognize and learn, and, and and I believe this to my core, is that most people don't have a conflict management problem. You know, most people know how to resolve conflict. And I know that doesn't sound like it makes sense, but the reality is, you know, if I asked anyone, hey, is it better to yell and scream and curse at people during conflict or to speak low, slow, in a respectful manner? Most people are going to tell you low, slow, and respectful. If I ask, is it best to hurl an insult at someone after you've been offended in a conversation 
or to let that roll off the shoulder and and re-engage the conversation from a respectful place that you wish someone would be leveraging towards you. Well, obviously, we're going to be respectful. It's not better to hurl an insult. So we know what to do. The problem is we don't do it under pressure, and that's because I believe we don't have a conflict management problem. What most people have is an emotional management problem, Hmm. and when we can manage our emotions more effectively, when we can recover from setbacks effectively, then we're able to leverage the tools we already have at our disposal to speak well, to listen effectively, to connect with people, to empathize. Those are basic things that we know how to do. We just don't know how to do them under pressure. Gosh, man, you said a whole lot there. You know, it's interesting. A couple of months ago, I was at an event where Dr. Sam Chan was speaking and he went through the gamut of things that he's seen in his career. And as you know, he's seen a lot in both ministry and in business. And one of the things he said, and it stood out to me, and it's just rung in my ears probably for about a year now, whenever it was, I went to that summit. He said, you know, I've seen a lot of mismanagement. He said, I've seen people mismanage money. I've seen people, you know, fall out of ministry because of affairs or things like that. He said, but what I've never seen anyone be able to recover from ever is losing their cool in front of other people. And he's like, that is just something that people are not able to recover and come back from. Why do you think that is? So, yeah, it's it's funny. It's something I, I studied in grad school, really trying to understand the dynamics of reputation management. And it was really, it was difficult because you know, PR companies will tell you a lot of times that we have to manage your reputation. And what I've come to discover, and this is my own theory on this, is that reputation is at least, there are at least two components of reputation, what I call passive and active. Your passive reputation is the story other people tell other people about you. You can't do much about that. It's me walking into a room and being introduced as a former hostage negotiator. It stirs up feelings and emotions in people. Some people love that. Other people don't like that. I can't do much about it. It's passive. It's just my story. It's my legend. But the active reputation is the side of me that you've actually encountered. It's the conversations we've had. It's the work. It's it's the lived experience you have with me. And at any given time, my active reputation is competing with my passive reputation. The story you're telling yourself about me versus the experience you're having with me. And I think it takes a lot of active reputation to change the narrative of the story we tell ourselves about people. That one time we lose our cool, that one active reputation will either confirm or cancel out a preconceived notion we have about someone. So if I already assume you're a jerk and then you do something that checks that box. Okay. Your passive reputation is sunk with me. The story I tell myself about you is that guy's a jerk. And that means anytime I see you not doing jerk things, (laughs) right. I'm telling myself that's the exception to the rule. Okay. Because I've seen his true colors. That's the exception to the rule. That's not who they really are. That's not who she really is. And so we really want to recognize that. And we have to be focused, focused, focused on reputation management and rapport building at the onset of every conversation, because we have to be intentional about making sure that people see us the way we want to be seen and that we're challenging the the stereotypes, the preconceived notions or the heuristic judgments that they have about us. And it's hard, right? Let's be clear. It's hard when someone's made up their mind, it's hard to change it. And I don't think we can change it because reputation doesn't belong to us. It belongs to the people who maintain subjective opinions about us. So all we can do is influence it. And we influence it by being consistent and and demonstrating character at the highest level as much as we possibly can to try to influence how someone sees us over time. Yeah, this makes me realize even deeper how important it is to manage your emotions in whatever situation you're in. And I think a lot about the the book Leadership and Self-Deception. And it goes into a lot of what you're talking about is that we our brain looks to quickly categorize people. Mm -hmm. So once we've categorized you and put you into a box, we look for everything to verify that that's the box you belong in. So if you've had an emotional blow up, I'm looking to continue to put you back in that box as, you know, ineffective, emotional, not a good leader. So even to your point, even when you do great things, I can't see that. All I can see is that you had this major blow up and that's who you are. And I'm just yeah. expecting, I'm waiting for you to do it again so I can say, see, see, yeah, see, 
Yeah. And there's theories on this for the, if you look into theories of persuasion and influence, it talks about something called source credibility or messenger bias. And, and it is the way we see people. In fact, whenever we have a conversation with someone just like this, we're conscious, uh, con unconsciously and continuously asking ourselves questions of the speaker. We're asking, are they competent? Do I trust them? And am I safe in their care? Mm -hmm. And then after I answer those questions, I'm asking it again. And I'm asking it again. Every time someone says something, I'm reevaluating. Are they competent? Do they know what they're talking about? Do I feel safe here? Do I trust what they're saying? And as long as the answer is yes, we'll keep listening. Wow. The problem is we don't have that mechanism at our fingertips. It happens automatically. And if we've already put somebody in a box, the moment they start speaking, we start telling ourselves unconsciously, the story we start telling ourselves is, I don't trust that person. Yeah. I don't think they're competent. I'm not safe here. And yeah. we'll tune them out. We don't listen. Yeah. And we will, we will miss the opportunities to change that narrative, but we will be hyper-focused on those opportunities to, to confirm our own bias, that confirmation bias. That's the difference between active listening and selective listening. Yeah. And what I hear you saying too is, you know, if this is an area where you struggle, right? Emotional management, this is why it's so important to get it under control because it can blow up your effectiveness. It can blow up your leadership. It can blow up the ability for people to listen to or believe in what you're saying. As a matter of fact, I want to, I want to read this quote that I heard yesterday and I would love your thoughts on it. Maybe this can be our, our closing thought because we're running out of time, but this is such a great conversation. So it's interesting. Some, this is a doctor that posted this the other day. They said, your accountability should be as loud as your disrespect in that same format. And I think the idea there is that <laughs> it's a funny quote, but, you know, I, I send it to my husband. He's like, huh, what do you, what do you take from, like, what does that mean to you? You know, but it's interesting because I think that that's how people feel about emotional blowups is that it's so demeaning to the people that experience it. It's somebody showing that they're flying off the handle and have no kind of wherewithal to control themselves. And it actually creates an emotion and a feeling in the room that sometimes it's hard to, to draw back from. And so I just, I thought that was a funny and interesting quote, but that is the sentiment and feeling that people have behind this kind of lack of ability to manage and dictate your emotions. Yeah. So some years ago at Victory, I, I had the, the privilege of working for the, the the original, we'll call him the original executive director of operations, Dave Nowak. And I was running into some challenges as a communicator because I came in from hostage negotiation. I, I came in from high level interrogations and I was a very confident communicator. And I kept running into these situations where people felt intimidated or offended at what I considered very basic conversations. And he said something to me that has stuck with me ever since. He says, Ryan, here's what I want you to understand about who you are as an individual. When you speak sprinkles, other people feel waterfalls. Wow. You have to watch the weight of your words. And I think if I'm understanding the quote well, with your accountability being as loud as your disrespect, I think what we have to understand is that disrespect, offense, negativity, hostility, conflict in itself, even when it's small, it feels so big. And so we have to have an equally proportionate, accountable response for ourselves and how we show up and how we correct the, the, the bad decisions and the bad behavior that we have. That's, that's the way I interpret that, right? It's not necessarily in terms of how that disrespect or negativity was expressed. It's what we're talking about is how is it felt? Mm -hmm. How is it felt? Yeah. And our accountability has to be at that level or higher if we're going to try to fix it. Powerful. Man, this has been so great. How do people find and follow you? By the way, let me just say this before you give all the accounts. You need to follow, follow Ryan. He's got so much more content around this. You can probably listen to this content for weeks and just glean and glean and glean from what he's got out there. So how do people find and follow you? And I'm going to ask people to, to, to go navigate to, to that right now as you share these different accounts where they can follow you. Yeah, sure. So we're on social media on Instagram at conflictish. It's conflict ish. We're on TikTok at conflictish and then conflictish.com. <laughs> we're conflictish everywhere. And then, you know, you can also follow me on LinkedIn for all professional connections and things of that nature too. And we do, we, we try to, we try to share daily conflict strategy tips. I try to give a, a, a nugget of 90 seconds or less 
every day. I don't always get to it because I get busy and I travel. But if you're looking for conflict tips and strategies on how to effectively communicate or regulate your emotions, the focus is primarily on interpersonal conflict management, how to get honest with yourself about yourself. And you can find those tips and strategies there. And the other thing too, Natalie, I'm really excited about is I'm writing a book. What? And yeah, That's I awesome. find it. I signed a deal with a with a publisher last month, and so I just submitted my table of contents and the introduction chapter. So we're getting all that mapped out. So we're writing a book on this concept of regulating your emotions, and I can't share the title of it just yet, but I think it's going to be really, really good. Here's the hint: I'll share. There's a video on our Instagram and our TikTok page, and the title of it is it's penned. It's titled "How to Untie Your Balloon," I believe is how it's titled. That's essentially what we're going to be talking about. How do you how do you take the the hot air out of yourself to avoid popping? under pressure. So I'm looking forward to getting that done. That's so awesome. Well, when you get your book launched, you'll have to come back and talk to us all about it and and share that. We're super excited for you. And thank you so much for your time today. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I look forward to, uh, to hearing this back. I think I learned some things here too. <laughs> <laughs> well, ladies, I just want to tell you that this type of conversation is exactly what we do on the Thrive Today platform. So head over to thrivetoday.com to learn more. And as you live your life, we want you to do it with leadership, community, and strength. We'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.